Hello friends, I am Dr. Rajesh Chokhani, General Pediatrician from Bandra, Mumbai and today in this video series we are beginning a new subsection on physical examination. So the topic for today is physical examination begins with observation. Friends, traditionally physical examination begins with inspection which is followed by palpation, percussion and auscultation. There is a very subtle difference between inspection and observation. In inspection, we see and notice physical uh, visual, visual findings but in observation we go a step further we actively look for not only visual but also auditory findings watch them carefully with an attention to detail and then interpret them different components of physical examination contribute differently in different systems for example Palpation contributes more than auscultation in the abdomen, whereas auscultation contributes more than palpation in the respiratory system. But observation contributes hugely to every system. Further, we have already said that history is thought in action. And observation is nothing but a continuum of this thought in action because it helps us to anticipate findings on further examination and keeps adding bit by bit to the final impression. In children, sometimes physical examination is difficult because the child is crying or at other times we need the cooperation of the patient to perform a part of the physical examination like looking for power in CNS which may not be possible because the patient is not able to follow our commands. At such times, observation can give almost the same information that we expect from further examination. Observation begins with assessing visually the growth of the patient and looking at the appearance to judge the level of sickness. We can look at the subcutaneous fat or the lack of it and muscle mass to decide about the nutrition of the patient and with practice and with time we can actually guess the height and weight of the patient merely by observation. In children, height is a marker of overall health of the child over the last few months or years and therefore a subnormal height suggests a chronic disease process. So if we assess height and weight in conjunction with each other, we can get an idea whether the disease process is acute, chronic or acute on chronic. A sick look suggests an acute bacterial infection or organ dysfunction. So these observations on growth and on appearance and level of sickness should be used in conjunction with the observation findings of the individual system and they help us to build an overall impression. Further, they also help us to narrow down the possibilities and when there are similar looking findings in different possibilities, they help us to differentiate between these different possibilities. Let's take the example of the respiratory system. Just by looking at the chest movements, retractions and the sounds produced during respiration, we can almost come to the correct diagnosis. So let's look at a two-year-old child who's come with fast breathing. If this child has suprasternal retractions and an audible strider, we start thinking of croup. And mind you, there is no further finding that we may get on further examination. However, if this two-year-old child with fast breathing is sick looking, is grunting, and we observe that he has reduced movement on one side, suggesting a localized disease, and he has intercostal retractions, suggesting a parenchymal disease, we have almost developed a pneumonia on observation. Similarly, if this two-year-old child has subcostal retractions, all that we need to do is confirm a wheeze on auscultation. Now let's look at a six-month-old baby who's come with fast breathing and we find that this baby has no chest retractions, movements are equal on both sides and there are no respiratory sounds like strider, wheeze or grunt. So, effectively, we've ruled out a pneumonia, we've ruled out upper airway obstruction and lower large airway obstruction. Now, if we add our observation of growth to this baby and if this baby is well nourished, it might be a case of bronchiolitis, whereas if this baby is malnourished, we might even be thinking of a renal tubular acidosis. So, this is how combining the observation on growth and sickness will help us in narrowing down the possibility. Now, after growth and looking at sickness, we look at many things on general examination like a characteristic facies of some syndrome or a hemolytic facies or an adenoid facies 
we look at a small head which suggests early onset of the disease in prenatal or perinatal period we look at large head which suggests hydrocephalus or megalencephaly and then of course we look at things like pallor ictus cyanosis clubbing edema once again any of these findings have to be clubbed and interpreted in conjunction with the individual system findings when it comes to cns a whole lot can be accomplished merely by observation let's look at a 2 year old child who is looking developmentally delayed we find that this child has a small head suggesting that the disease started in the prenatal or perinatal period this child does not have any dysmorphic faces suggesting that chromosomal causes are unlikely this child is moving all limbs but is crossing the legs suggesting that the power is at least grade 3 by 5 but and there is hypertonia or spasticity and this child does not have any facial asymmetry squint or drooling of saliva suggesting that there is no third fourth sixth seventh ninth tenth cranial nerve affection and finally this child's nutrition and growth seems near normal suggesting that this is a non progressive disease and we realize that we have almost diagnosed the spastic cerebral palsy on observation similarly many other observations can be made in the cns like looking at the sensorium looking at other cranial nerves involuntary movements hypotonic postures other hypertonic postures etc gait offers a tremendous amount of information so we can look at a circumduction gait of hemiplegia or a toe walking gait of spastic diplegic cp or a waddling gait of proximal muscle weakness or an ataxic gait which when coupled with incoordination while going for an object with or without nystagmus suggests a cerebellar disease in fact looking at some injury marks and callosities on the extremities might in go far so go so far to suggest that we are looking at sensory abnormalities like affection of crude and crude touch and temperature sense or if a patient is ataxic only when eyes are closed then we might suspect a position sense affection due to the posterior column involvement let's come to the cvs so we have a 9 month old infant who is looking cyanotic with mild clubbing but is not sick looking which tells us that this is a chronic disease but probably not a respiratory disease now if this infant is undernourished it suggests that this is more likely to be a cardiac disease rather than a congenital myth hemoglobinemia we notice a mild precordial bulge suggesting that there is ventricular hypertrophy which started very early in life when the chest wall is compliant and we notice that there are no pulsations on the precordium suggesting that it is not a hyperdynamic circulation if you were to add all this together we have diagnosed a congenital cyanotic heart disease with reduced pulmonary blood flow setting most probably fallows physiology already on observation similarly other observation findings for example if the apex beat is down and out it suggests a lvh and if there are lot of pulsations on the precordium it suggests that this lvh is due to a hyperdynamic circulation in an older child this could be a valvular regurgitant lesion and in we were to notice dancing carotids we have narrowed it down to aortic regurgitation further if this child seems to have a steroid facies then we can even go to the extent of saying that he or she who recently had a episode of rheumatic carditis or a uh, cardiac failure coming to a child with extreme pallor once again if we were to look just look at presence or absence of distension of abdomen look at the growth of the child whether the child is sick or not sick facies and presence of purpura etc we can narrow down to a group of anemia so if this child does have abdominal distension it suggests that there is cardio uh, organomegaly which means that this anemia is likely to be either hemolytic anemia or an infiltrative disease whereas if this child does not have abdominal distension then it is likely to be a deficiency anemia or an aplasia next we look at whether this child is sick looking or not sick looking so if this child is sick looking out of the previous four groups it could be either a infiltrative disorder or an aplasia which is further confirmed by a uh, presence of purpura now if the child is not sick looking we are left with hemolytic anemia and deficiency anemia 
again we look at the growth of the child if this child is short in height but weight is normal it suggests a hemolytic anemia maybe this child may have an hemolytic facies also and if this child is normal in growth then it's likely to be a deficiency anemia which in fact can be further characterized by the presence of platinaikia coilonaikia suggesting iron deficiency anemia and pigmentation suggesting b12 deficiency so friends we see that in almost every system we can get examples of how observation helps us tremendously so there is no doubt it that it is the first crucial step during physical examination we agree that if the disease is mild or very early these observation findings may not be very obvious but still we must make it a habit to observe so that with time we sharpen our observation skills and keep thinking as we go along which is good not only for the patient but also for ourselves thank you the next video will be by dr mahesh mohite on a thorough examination less to be miss something